I'm Anne Kullman. Uh, I work at the Department for Humanitarian Asian and Middle East, Middle East and Northern Africa support. <laughs> it's a big department, but I work specifically with partnerships for the private sector, mainly. And uh, as I think you have understood, we will talk mainly about our experiences of multi-stakeholder partnerships in partnerships with the private sector. But first, I thought I would tell you a little bit about CEDA. CEDA is a government agency, myndighet, um, that is under the jurisdiction of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So the government decides what we do, uh, and we carry out the tasks in development and operation. <laughs> and in 2015, we got the policy framework for, uh, for development cooperation and uh, um, humanitarian assistance, and that dictates the direction for CEDA and what we do. And it combines the Agenda 2030, the yeah, that's good. I saw that there. Uh, the, uh, tw the Agenda 2030, the with the Sustainable Development Goals, the Adeda, uh, the Addis, Adeda Ababa. <laughs> <laughs> Addis Ababa, thank you, Action Agenda and the uh, Paris uh, Climate Agenda together in one, in one uh, direction for us. And uh, we, the, the policy framework sets out uh, or emphasizes the role of partnerships and the importance of partnerships and working together with different actors. Uh, and it particularly sets out um, cooperation with business actors in partner countries, which is perhaps the first time it, it talked about this in this way. So you can read here yourself what it says about working together with the, with the private sector. It's a bit difficult when I have this. <laughs> and here are some of the, here are some of the uh, different actors that we work together with, and private sector, and one more, financial institution investors are fairly new ones to us, to the other ones that are maybe perhaps more traditional than the ones we used to work with, or we have worked before. But uh, this, with the global goals, over, already before that came in 2015, CEDA had got instruction from the government to work with, the, or to develop ways of working with the private sector in 2012 already. And uh, so we started, we got some funds so we could develop some methods and some pilot projects to, or rather the pilot projects to develop methods to work with the private sector in different ways. And this was a new way of working for us, of course, so it was a bit of experimenting and learning together. And there was only, not only a chance for us to, to, ex to show others externally and to, to do this, but also internally to to show the opportunities and possibilities of working with the private sector internally at CEDA. Um, and the project with Katarina and Tetra Park, Tetra Laval was one of those. Exactly. Um, we work, like I said, we developed these different methods of working together with, uh, with the private sector. Um, Excellent. Uh, so here are four of those different methods. Uh, drivers of change is mainly when we work with uh, organization or uh, watchdogs to help and to push private sector to work in sustainable development. Public-private development partnerships, PPDPs, which are, you, you saw the, you saw PPPs on Herman's uh, show, I saw, I think, uh, here is what we work on, public-private development partnerships. They are usually larger projects, and uh, they are the ones where we work with the private sector or with the private actor company and the third partner of implementing something. And we have a few examples at the moment, uh, Katarina, but also um, where we work with vocational training in, in uh, Africa, in uh, Ethiopia with Volvo, for example. Challenge funds are a way of us supporting uh, small scale, usually, uh, entrepreneurs and innovators who have innovations that they want to develop. And usually this is in a competition form, so they compete for funds that we then support during a, during a, a few years. And guarantees are part of our uh, methods of working with innovative financing, where we see that takes the risk of, for example, a bank or financial institutions that want to lend money to, um, to people who usually don't have access to lending, perhaps because they lack private equity. Uh, we take the risk of them not paying back, and the bank are then more willing to lend to private people. 
But as I said, we've developed different ways and have some experiences from working with the private sector and we have met some challenges and of, of course a lot of opportunities and there are some common things. So Anne, I'm going to hand over to you to tell a bit more about this. Thank you so much. And uh, I borrowed this yes. one. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry for this late hour, but uh, I have a lot to tell. I will try to keep it short um, and just pick some cherries of experiences that we had in forming partnerships, but also current challenges that uh, we, I am facing, and I will be quite uh, frank with you. So, um, yeah, welcome to this journey. <laughs> So actually, I have been, been helping CEDA and helping to explore uh, and developing some of those partnerships. And together with Katharina, we've had some hard times trying to find ways of collaborating, mainly not up between us, but made with the UN agencies uh, that maybe were a little bit slower in picking up the beauty of, of those markets, of the partnerships, and also didn't have the structures, maybe. But as Katarina says, I mean, you need to look where you have the collaboration opportunity, and that's really the starting point. I will not dwell more on that. I will go to the... Uh, so our principles, when we collaborate with the private sector, and uh, I will emphasize again what Katarina says, we have to look... We only collaborate with the private sector uh, in their core business, uh, because uh, we don't want to do freelance tropic work, we want to change uh, how systems, how societies work, how business sector work, and how they can push for sustainable development. Uh, we also, of course, as a public agency handling taxpayers' money, we need to look into the costs and risks uh, and share the costs and risks of doing these partnerships. Um, we need to make sure that they are catalytic, that they are kind of, uh, can be scaled up and so on. We always have to look into if this partnership, this uh, action wouldn't happen without us. And I'm thinking about uh, the idea that you presented, that you had already developed two of those dairy hubs, and we facilitated the scaling up of it. But we also, I would say in this case, facilitated that there is uh, an evaluation that we have done on this program. Uh, not all findings are <laughs> very Good, but I mean, and we don't agree maybe with all the fundings, but uh, findings, but uh, it will help us to continue this dialogue <coughs> and sharing of how we should act to create great impact. And we need <coughs> partnership with global organizations like World Bank and others to scale up those innovative, innovative approaches that we are kind of piloting. So the ultimate aim of our partnerships are, of course, to make a systemic change of markets. And the countries that we are assigned to work in, and that is actually something that CEDA currently is looking into, how we can possibly, if and how we can possibly apply more of an um, adaptive approach and a market system approach, not only to programs in uh, market development, but also generally. Where can we push the right, or draw the right strings to make a change happen for the good, for sustainable development, without changing the whole market system? So, uh, well, I will not take the talk about this any longer because we have talked about that. Uh, but normally what we do when we partner with the private sector and what makes it a multi-stakeholder partnership is that maybe we find a common ground with private companies. It could be one, it could be several. We have example of public-private partnerships where we actually have 24 Swedish rooted companies trying to change the behavior, behavior of their uh, business partners where they are sourcing textile and garment from in Asia mainly. Um, by uh, developing their own guidelines, a business-driven initiative to develop own guidelines to reduce uh, the use of water, chemical, and uh, energy in the garment production value chains. So that is a program where we partnered with uh, Swedish uh, um, International Water Institute, the neighbor to SAE here, uh, to um, yeah, try this out in the supply chain of around 300 of these garment retailers' uh, supply chain. 
So that is a very interesting program, I would say, where the, there are a lot, lot of learnings when it comes to how to collaborate uh, with the multi-stakeholder partnership in this, because it's not only the business here, it's the business there, and there are other driving forces uh, that are uh, presenting challenges, but also opportunities. This is my last slide, <laughs> and this uh, I jump directly into to some of the lessons. But I will share with you yet another example of uh, public-private partnerships, where we have learned a lot about the challenges of partnering with uh, in, in multi-stakeholder partnerships. And that is uh, some pilot projects we started in Cambodia, Bangladesh, and Myanmar around and Ethiopia uh, around how we could enhance decent work in the garment sector supply chain. Um, because uh, there are several kind of difficulties when it comes to, to uh, uh, low wages, untra untransparent systems of wages, uh, over time, uh, bad working conditions and so on. Things that normally, and in our country, uh, yes, last 80 years maybe, <laughs> have been solved through social dialogue between um, the social partners, normally the, the workers and trade unions and the employers, and in some cases the governments are also uh, included in this. So we tried out a work with, that was initiated together with H&M, which is a great uh, company, a big company, that have quite advanced thinking and want to make an systemic change of the work markets where they work. Uh, they can't do that themselves. They are not the only company sourcing from different countries. Uh, and, and to do that kind of change, they wanted to partner with us and also with ILO. So we set up those projects in these countries. Uh, we started already in 2012, and uh, now we learned a lot from this. And when we had those partnerships, we ran on into several problems and challenges uh, in the partnership. There was a lot of conflicts in between the partners. <laughs> and um, uh, we were a bit irritated on each other. We had, we had difficulties in understanding uh, why things didn't happen the way we had kind of agreed on or so. So we set up a specific partnership dialogue forum actually between us. So once or twice a year, we have met, uh, not to talk about the specific progresses in, in those specific programs, but uh, to actually talk about how we collaborate. Quite frank discussions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we started with this kind of normal, what works well, um, what, what does not work so well? Um, what should we continue doing? And what should we stop doing? And what should we maybe start doing differently? So that has helped us in creating a better understanding of both our objectives with the collaborations, but also um, the impediments that we face uh, as we represent different bureaucracies, uh, both the public ones and private ones and, and the UN ones. Uh, and some things we, as a donor agency, we can, of course mainly it has been, can I share with you, uh, ILO that we <laughs> have been <laughs> trying to push uh, towards a little bit changed behavior and uh, speedier processes and so on. Of course, we don't have time to wait for this. There are many people suffering out there, so we, we are in quite a hurry. And um, we can use our leverage of being a, a global donor to ILO also to lift these aspects up and work to kind of uh, change those aspects of how ILO works. It's not easy, but it's a bit similar to what we're trying to do with the Swedish, or through the Swedish FIO committee trying to make those uh, Rome-based um, <coughs> UN organizations change a little bit how they behave. Um, and also, now you can see I've, I've, I've uh, listed some aspects where um, lessons learned from our uh, joint partnerships. Um, I, I will, before I go into this, actually mention also that now we are trying to scale up 
these partnerships and the learnings that we are used and have, have gained from working with our donation I mean, in poor countries, we are trying to do something bigger and very visionary on a regional level in Asia, where we, uh, together with ILO, have gathered the ILO constituencies, the governments, employers and workers, and other uh, stakeholders, like the global brands, like uh, CV, like other organizations engaged in this sector, uh, to jointly see how can we make a change of this whole system of uh, low wages and, and the run to the bottom kind of system that is prevailing in the, in the garment sector. And also how we can uh, improve the environmental management because that is acute. It's the second largest polluter in the world and so on. But uh, doing this, um, it takes a lot of kind of, we need to take a co-creational approach, uh, I believe. Um, uh, ILO in Geneva are very much into this. Um, I mean, they have, they have a 100 year experience of having a multi stakeholder <coughs> partnership actually, as they have this 100 year collaboration with the ILO constituents that I mentioned before. But the reality now is that the global brands have a big stake and want to change things for the better, many of them at least, uh, in the government sector. So we, have to, we, also, we are also challenging uh, a 100-year-old partnership model. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's mortal, I would say. It's, it's not easy because the employers organization, the factory owners, they are very, very strong. Talking about power that Herman talked about before. And the governments are also very strong. Low wages is a, an advantage for them when selling to the global markets and so on. So it is, and then us and the global brands trying to um, provoke a change in this. Uh, it is challenging. We actually had a meeting a year ago, a year and a half ago in Bangkok, where we, got, where we gathered all the ILO constituents from 10 countries in Asia, together with global brands and other organizations. We tried to create a, an atmosphere of opening up for trust and so on. It just wouldn't do. It wasn't mm -hmm. possible. So we had close discussions with ILO constituents and then other stakeholders group. And then to have a joint discussion, we had to do that in plenum. So we were 115 people <laughs> in a big hall <laughs> trying to have a joint dialogue between those. So we are here challenging kind of a historic kind of partnership model uh, with the need from modernizing this. So we are in the middle of this. Uh, we are not all, all, uh, either doing all things well, I would say. Uh, as Katarina says, we have ideas on headquarters, we have experiences, and maybe it clashes with, it does clash with our own systems, how we work, how we expect partners to come with, in with a program proposal, and then we should swallow and finance and reduce the cost a bit and then finance. But in this, in this partnership, we really need to sit down, invest in a lot of time mm -hmm. to explore how can we do this? Uh, to build on all the partnerships, all the programs that are out there. There are millions of programs. Um, and we're in that right now. Um, also struggling with the, uh, the ILO office, in the regional office in Bangkok, to understand what we want to do with this. But also my colleagues in Bangkok, to understand that we need to change the way we design, the way we do this, because this is a very visionary approach. I will, yeah, so the relationship management I talked about, the co-creational approach I talked about, you have to step over to your partner's side to try to understand why they are doing that. Not to be bad, but what is the driving force? What are the impediments? And also to manage risks. Um, I am also the H&M focal point at CEDA. We don't have focal points for pri many private companies, but H&M is one of those since we have a big a partnership with them, not only within the social sector, but also the environmental field. Because in many, yeah, and that sticks into the eye of normal Swedish citizens, some, mm. <laughs> uh, because they don't understand, they think that, oh, the, the business sector is only <laughs> wanting to do profit and so on. Um, 
So I devote quite some time uh, to manage uh, uh, communication ri uh, risk, or what can you say, when, when uh, journalists kind of write big articles, because I have to manage the risk of my organization being engaged with the business partner, us. Hot, can I call it that? <laughs> like H&M, because they, all, they are the ones that always are on the news if there is something happening in the garment sector, regardless if they are involved or not. Uh, so. But uh, we try to also manage the risks by, I think you should manage the risks also initially when you set up your partnership and also talk about it during the partnership. Um, but w um, in how you develop your um, agreements, maybe a memorandum of understanding how you should communicate about the partnership. Um, and also, yeah, you, you have to be very transparent to each other uh, and tell. It's, maybe it's a risk for H&M to be <laughs> involved with us as well if they are bad publicity from CEDA. So it's, it's, a, it's a give and take actually. But we do this because we think that we will gain and we have a possibility to actually change the uh, system. And it's not only with H&M, but they are the driver uh, from the business side and they have big partnership platforms that they're very good at partnering. So we also enjoy their kind of uh, other partners and, and access to, to supply chain and other partners. That's uh, some of my confessions here <laughs> <laughs> about possibilities, but also the challenges that we are facing. Thank you. Very inspirational. Uh, questions? Am I allowed? Um, thank you so much. Very inspiring um, um, uh, presentations about um, these. Uh, I mean, I'm just uh, working on the liberalize at the moment, and uh, very interesting when you said that ILO actually is a challenging one, even though they work on a lot on the partnerships. But as I understanding is the same with the other UN related partners, they can only ratify law, they cannot implement on certain mm -hmm. countries, right? They are, say Thailand ratified per, uh, certain uh, sections of mm -hmm. ILO, they have to um, contextualize into the country, to each country um, into their own law, especially under the labor law. Uh, is CEDA have any kind of advocacy or lobbying roles into that? Uh, that's the first question. And the second question is, how do you deal with testability through the supply chain? Because like H&M will definitely have not mm. hundreds of mm. other small retailers. Mm. So, so how would you deal with that? Mm. Uh, well, we do different things. Uh, if I start with the latter question, actually, uh, as Cecilia says, we are not only working with, in partnership with the private companies, we are also uh, working with uh, NGOs uh, organizations and watchdog organizations to push the private sector to become more transparent, to become uh, more adherent to, to sustainability principles. So that is one thing. Uh, and I think that this, uh, what I've learned working with the business sector for the last uh, seven, eight years is that the business uh, companies that are sincere and want to kind of build long-term success they are often also ready to invest quite a lot in managing their risks, and that is managing the supply chain, and so on. And I can see a positive change, when, it, when it, uh, at least within the garment sector, I'm not so knowledgeable about other sectors actually, uh, that more and more companies are displaying and are making their uh, supply lists transparent. But then there is always a problem with short lead times, uh, the suppliers with which the retailers have a contract with. Uh, in their case, if time is short, they will subcontract to others as well. And that, uh, of course, is a question. And I think now the debate in Swedish news about banks and how they invest and so on, it's also, this is the same thing. We also support a, a program called uh, Fair Finance Guide. Where, uh, which builds on consumer pressure, uh, where you, through an app, can, and that was actually originated in 
uh, the Netherlands <laughs> by Oxfam Nobel. So we've done that in Sweden, we are doing that in Britain and Asia to push investors to make sure that they are uh, taking um, sustainable choices when instead of investing in oil, coal and other <laughs> extractives maybe and so on. So we are doing a little bit of everything. Um, and yes, of course, I would not say that ILO is particularly difficult to work with, maybe due to their kind of one, they are celebrating 100 years <laughs> to this year mm -hmm. with their setup. And of course, uh, headquarters, and there are changes, there are resolutions that are adopted, uh, which says that they should enhance their work with uh, decent work in, in uh, global supply chains. And that includes, uh, to include other partners as well. But uh, there are, um, what do you say, challenges, and, and uh, uh, we have to manage the um, resistance throughout the organization. It's a global organization, it's very strong. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe ILO is, has most challenges internally to kind of make sure that all country offices adopt this thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your first question. There are some short additional <coughs> questions. Maybe everyone are hungry now. <laughs> yeah. So we have heard very nice stories. Well, first, a nice introduction, the setting the stage by Herman. Then we had a couple of uh, nice presentations from most stable partnerships and also the donor side. And they uh, highlight both the challenge, but also where are the sweet spots for collaboration? Where do you find the synergy? And how can you um, navigate in this uh, area to make most stable partnerships more effective? Um, I think right now our sweet spot is outside this door. <laughs> um, we're all hungry and uh, we're, uh, we're a bit over time, but that's okay. Um, sorry, my